when you commit suicide you can't hide your body hey guys welcome back to my channel if you're new here please do subscribe and if you're old here hello again today's case is a missing person case and it's based in illinois and a bit in wisconsin i think the main thing in this one is just like it is so open-ended, there are no answers, there's a lot of theories, and it's just, it'll really get your mind going. So this is the disappearance of Lee Cutler. Lee was 18 years old, and he lived in Buffalo Grove in Illinois, and he was in his final year of high school, and it was, as far as I know, like a, a really big high school, so it was very easy to like, fade into the background kind of thing and obviously he was at a point in his life where he really needed to think about like what he wanted to do with life and just where he wanted to bring himself and everything and he was one of those people who I don't want to say people pleaser because I don't want to put a negative vibe on it but he really just didn't want to ever let anyone down if he was ever struggling with anything emotionally, he wouldn't want to burden anyone else with his own problems. But he was also a bit of an overthinker and he did struggle with his mental health. So this is all quite difficult for him, you know? Lee was also Jewish and he held his religious beliefs and his morals very close to him. And it was just a massive part of his life. In fact, he was even the president of a religious youth group. So he was just very much involved in the community and he just, it was a massive part of his life. So this case all kicks off in October of 2007 and on Friday the 19th of October it was just a typical kind of school day however there was an 18th birthday party that evening of one of his friends and I mean <laughs> because the legal age in America is 21 there was family involved like they went out for dinner and there were parents there and everything Lee's mom was actually there as well and her name was Beth Why is the lighting shady already? And while they were at this party, Lee asked his mom could he stay the night at one of his friend's houses. So she was like, sweet. And soon after, she actually went home. But before she did, Lee gave her a big hug. And in retrospect, Beth was thinking that hug lasted longer than normal. Which might be of significance. Maybe it means he knew something bad was going to happen. Or maybe it was just one of those times where you hug your loved ones closer and longer than normal, you know? I don't know, it's just interesting to note. Lee appeared to be having a pretty good time with his friends, nothing really seemed off, and they ended up staying up pretty late until I think it was like around 3 or 4 a.m. playing video games. But at midnight, Lee had texted a close female friend of his, but he was basically saying that he was having a lot of trouble fitting in with these guys and communicating with them and like if you've ever been in that situation it's, it's insanely uncomfortable but he specifically said that he needed help and obviously this friend comforted him and was like you know everything is going to be okay don't worry blah 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 and that was that but she didn't really think much of it because Lee was a bit of an overthinker and to be honest this wouldn't have been all that concerning only for what happened the following day so on Saturday the 20th of October Lee dropped his friend off home at 9.50 a.m. And he was due into work at Rock America, which is like a clothing store in Vernon Hills in Illinois at 12 p.m., so at midday. Um, so he had a bit of time, but like he still had to go to work. Obviously that morning, Beth, his mom, contacted him to say, what's up, you all good? Like as any parent would after their child has spent the night somewhere else. Um, she was just checking in on him, um, but he didn't reply. He was usually pretty good at responding, but like any 18 year old, he was a bit flaky with it sometimes, like he'd forget or whatever. So she wasn't panicked, but she was slightly worried, just slightly. And because of this, she decided to pop into his work in the early afternoon. She was like, you know what? I might as well go check just to be sure. Now, when she got there, she started talking to his manager and she basically informed Beth that he didn't show up for work. So the two of them were kind of a little bit worried. It wasn't like him to do that, but they kind of assumed, you know what? Maybe he misinterpreted the time that he was meant to be in work. Um, there was a shift that started at 5 p.m. as well, and maybe he thought that was his shift that day. So they exchanged numbers and they said, you know what, if there's any update, we'll be in contact with each other. So while Beth was waiting, she was calling his friends, just checking if anyone had any update on him or where he was or anything, but nobody really had any kind of new information for her. Now, like I said, Lee did struggle with mental health sometimes and 
This was something that he often worked through by going off on his own somewhere and just journaling and just trying to clear his mind and just process things. So there wasn't like immediate panic at the start of this. But then at 5 p.m., Lee's manager contacted Beth and she said he never showed up for work. So again, slightly worrying um, and his friends still hadn't heard from him, but they did say the next place he would probably show up would be at the bowling alley. This was where the religious youth group were gonna be meeting up that night. And obviously Lee was the president of this group. He was basically the one that organized these events. So it wouldn't make sense for him to not show up to that, you know, he never missed them. And it wasn't even just that he had the responsibility of showing up, but he truly felt like he fit in with these people because they were connected because of such a deep rooted, I don't wanna say interest, <laughs> but like religion, you know, it was something that they all held quite close to them and he just felt like he could totally be himself with those people. So that was another reason why he would not miss these events. But unfortunately, Lee never showed up. So at around 9.40 p.m., Beth reported Lee as a missing person. And it was basically all hands on deck. All his friends and family started searching in like his local hangout spots where he liked to go to process his emotions and everything. And there was no sign of him. So because he had been struggling, they kind of thought, oh my God, what if he's run away? And when the police searched his bedroom, they didn't really find anything that would suggest that he was gonna be gone for an extended period of time. But the only thing missing was a bit of cash. It was about $500 that was gone, which was slightly concerning because they were like, why does he need this money? Why can't he use a card? But in spite of this, they, their initial thoughts were kind of that he was gonna return pretty soon. The following day, he still hadn't shown up, but a tip had come in from the local gas station. An employee that worked there had supposedly seen Lee at 10 p.m. This would have meant that he was in the area all of Saturday and that way he wouldn't have been able to get as far. With missing person cases, as we know, the first 48 hours are crucial. And this basically set that time ticking from a much later hour. They gained 12 hours on that 48 hours, if that makes sense. But when police went to confirm this sighting, the CCTV footage had already been erased. So obviously they spoke to this potential witness again and after questioning him, they realized that it wasn't actually 10 p.m. that he had seen Lee, it was 10 a.m. How do you make that mistake though? I don't know, like had this guy been working the night shift and then saw him at 10 a.m. and thought it was 10 p.m. or did he just like say p.m. by accident or something? I don't know, but like, I just found that a little weird, I don't know. So basically all we know about the timeline is at 9.50 a.m. he dropped his friend off home and at 10 a.m., only 10 minutes later, he went to the gas station. So not really the most promising lead. Also, his phone had stopped pinging at about 12.20 p.m. So that was only two hours and 20 minutes after he was at the gas station. So that either means that he turned it off or it ran out of battery or something. Also bear in mind, he must have been driving somewhere because his car was nowhere to be found either. Now a little bit more on his mental health. As I said, he did struggle with mental health with depressive episodes and anxiety and that kind of thing. He had a lot of deep feelings and would overthink quite a bit. There was a point in his freshman year in high school where he had gone through a really tough breakup. He had been in a relationship with a girl who was a little bit older. So she had actually moved on to college and basically they decided, you know what, this we can't actually do this. He had too many responsibilities with school. She was somewhere else in college and it was just, they had to break up. And the breakup took a massive toll on him. It affected him really badly. One day, he actually showed up in school with a knife and was threatening to kill himself. Luckily, he was stopped and he was transported to a hospital where he was basically on full-time watch Honestly, like the effect this had on him was just detrimental. He was so angry. He just did not want to be there. And basically he was kind of just riding the wave of whatever he needed to do to get out. So he went through the therapy, he went through whatever they told him to do just so that he could get out of this situation because he was just so mad that he was even there. And eventually he did get out, which was great. However, 
He still was the type of person that didn't want to burden other people with his negative emotions. Also a pretty significant fact in this case is a couple of months before Lee's disappearance, his grandmother was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer and because of this, his mother actually moved in with her so that she could take care of her. And this was not ideal for Lee because that would leave him with his stepfather, who he didn't really get on with. I don't know the specifics of how badly they got on together, but I do know that tensions were running high and it just was not a happy environment for him. The fact that he didn't even have his mom there to kind of ease that tension at all made it even worse. On top of the fact that he just really missed his mom. So he was struggling for a lot of reasons because of this whole living situation. Now, I think the police did an absolutely fantastic job on this case. They did take the red flags seriously, which was amazing. A lot of times when a police department thinks that someone's run away, they're kind of like, whatever, it's up to them to come back and blah, blah, blah. But then sometimes something bad could genuinely have happened. So they really did look into it very thoroughly. So fast forward to October the 22nd. So this is two days after he went missing. So like I said, the police had worked so diligently on this case and they had actually labeled him as an endangered missing person over the age of 18. And because of this, there was a message sent out to all of the surrounding police departments, which would obviously allow them to be able to keep an eye out for him. And at around 3.40 a.m. on October the 22nd, Lee's car was actually found. But it was found almost 200 miles from his home. Basically, it was found in a place called Baraboo, which was in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin, guys. Like, there was nothing around. Specifically, his car was in like this rest stop type car park where you can hardly even call it a car park, but it was the only car there. So this is a little weird and it's a little worrying, but there wasn't anything all that unusual about the car. There was no sign of a struggle. The doors were locked. It had been parked perfectly, but it had been found by a police officer and he knew that this car had belonged to an endangered missing person. So the Buffalo Grove Police Department and Lee's family drove out there as soon as they could and they set out on a massive search. There were about 50 people searching. They searched the land in the surrounding areas. They even got helicopters with infrared light to basically see if there was any kind of sign of body heat or anything on the ground. All in all, they just went above and beyond to find this guy. Unfortunately, there was no sign of Lee himself. However, they did find a couple of items that belonged to him. He had made like a makeshift campsite. There was like a blanket and a bottle of water and a backpack, that kind of stuff. But then they also found some concerning items as well. There was a bottle of Advil PM and a bottle of Coracidin. So obviously this is not a good sign. We know that Lee struggled a lot with his mental health. We even know that he was struggling right up until the night before when he texted his friend. And now we had two medication bottles, one of which was empty, the Advil PM was empty. And now we're finding his car in a random place in the middle of nowhere and some of his stuff and empty medication bottles. Like, it's not sending off very positive vibes, you know. An overdose from Advil PM would very likely kill you if it doesn't, it's at the very least severe organ damage, so that's not good and the carcedin is likely to cause severe hallucinations. And struggling with mental health and going through hallucinations in the middle of nowhere, I can't imagine that's a healthy kind of combination. I would say that would be absolutely terrifying. It's just not giving me a good feeling. And that's those two medications on their own. So imagine how detrimental the combination will be for your system. A little bit more about the location of where this makeshift kind of campsite was. It was only like 10 feet away from the Baraboo River. They knew like straight away, they were like, we need to search this river. But the thing about it was, it was quite slow moving. 
and there was a lot of debris. There had been a lot of fallen trees in it and just a lot of random debris in this river. If he had, say, fallen in, it would be quite likely that he would become caught on something. Oh, God, it's mad to think about, but first of all, they found Lee's yarmulke, which I was like, what is that? <laughs> I'm not all that familiar with Jewish culture or terminology, but um, it's basically like the cap that kind of covers just this kind of amount. So obviously, I mean, that would have been pretty important to him because he held his religious beliefs so close to him. So it's a bit worrying that that was found. They also found his wallet and inside this wallet was his ID, some cash, not sure of the amount. From what I've seen, it looks like a good chunk of it was gone, but I don't know the specific amount. Now, they also found some khaki trousers and these were actually the ones that Lee had been wearing that day. And they found his belt and his car keys as well. So he wasn't gonna be getting back into the car anytime soon. I don't know, there's, there's a lot of question marks and a lot of like, was this intentional, was this not intentional? But then they found some notes and there was a particular note to his mother. And this note is one of the biggest pieces of evidence in this case. It doesn't say for definite what happened, but it does lead a lot of people to believe this ended a certain way. And basically this note said, my head is too big for my body. Finally, I get some sleep. I'm sorry, mom, for being a coward. I love you, mom. Please be happy. So it definitely seems like a suicide note. But then his friends did say after that, that, you know, he was such a deep person. Um, when he went off to his favorite hangout spots to like journal about his feelings and everything, he would write in that kind of tone and he would write in a way that he would be the only person to understand it. So even though there are definitely tones of suicide in that note, like we don't really know for sure because it could have just been one of those times where he wrote a deep note or like journaled his feelings or something like that. So it's really, really tough to say. So the next port of call was to search the inside of his vehicle, basically to figure out like where he had been, was there any sign of where he had planned to go? And they actually found a lot. Firstly, there was a receipt for the Kettle Moraine State Park in Wisconsin. And um, an interesting part about this was it was $7 to go in if you lived in the state. But if you lived out of state, it was $10. And he did, he lived in Illinois. But he actually paid the $7. So that kind of made them think, is this a sign that maybe he was with someone? Was he with someone who could potentially be from Wisconsin? What was that about, you know? But as far as I know, they did rule that out, the possibility of there being someone else. Secondly, then there was the Walmart receipt. So basically, obviously he had bought that Advil PM and the Coracidin, and that was exactly what was on the receipt for Walmart. It wasn't even so much that they had the receipt, but they were like, Walmart has a crap ton of CCTV. So that was like a direct way to like, okay, maybe we can see, was he with someone? what was he wearing? Like we think we know what he was wearing, but maybe he had extra clothes or whatever. Like just to be sure of the details or if anything seemed off. And in this CCTV footage, he was alone and he was wearing the same outfit that he was wearing that morning, which his friends would have seen him in and everything. Then in the boot of the car, they found a book. And I'm gonna leave you on a cliffhanger there because I'll come back to that in the theories. There was also a huge interstate only seven miles away and they kind of thought maybe he hitchhiked. There was a lot of hitchhiking in this area and Lee was very comfortable with truck drivers. Bit of a random fact about him, but he would often go to like truck stops and just kind of chat with the truck drivers and stuff. So he was more than comfortable with those people. There was even a potential that he had kind of set this all up to like lead people astray and make them think that one thing happened when really it was buying him time to get away. People didn't really put this past him, but again, like no real evidence. But also like the thing with the hitchhiking, um, he had taken his trousers off and they were like found by the river. So, I mean, personally, maybe this makes me a bad person, but if I am driving along an interstate 
and I see a guy at the side of the road with no trousers on and he's trying to get a lift, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not pulling in like as a safety thing obviously but like maybe there are people out there that would approach that situation more as like a good Samaritan type of thing <laughs> but obviously that's not me. Um, <laughs> or maybe he had like an extra pair of trousers or something, I don't know. All right, so believe it or not, they are all the facts we have. So I'm gonna bring you through the theories now. I've got five theories for you today and they all have decent kind of reasons as for why they're theories in this case. Can you even with this lighting? Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> This is actually painful, I'd say. Sorry, <laughs> no, no. Okay, moving on. The first theory in this case is that it was a suicide. This is the theory that most people believe and for good reason, I would say. First things first, there was the fact that he previously struggled with mental health and did so right up until the night before. There was the empty bottle of Advil PM, there was the Coracidin, there was the note, there was the fact that his wallet was left behind with ID and cash and his yarmulke, which would have been pretty important to him. But this theory does pose the question, why did he have to go so far away from home? He was almost 200 miles from home. He was in a totally different state. Initially, at first glance, that doesn't make any sense. However, there are some kind of tidbits of ideas that make it make a bit more sense. Maybe this place had some kind of meaning to him. Maybe he'd been there before. Like I said, he did have a good few like hangout spots and places that he loved to go when things were getting a little too much for him. And according to his friends and family, he had actually been there before. And then there's also the fact that the last time he threatened to take his own life, he was hospitalized and that made him so mad. So if he had really decided to take his own life, it wouldn't be that confusing that he would go so far away from home because he wouldn't want anyone to really stop him. The only counter argument for this theory that I can't really personally explain is the fact that when you commit suicide, you can't hide your body. There was such a massive search done, they covered a very large area on land and in the air and it was likely that if he did end up in the river that he would have been caught on some debris or a tree or something and then there's also the fact that like it was a very slow moving river. It wouldn't have pulled him away that drastically. So that's the one thing that kind of niggles on my mind is okay maybe he did commit suicide but where is he then? So that's the end of that theory. The second theory is that he went off to basically live in the wilderness. And for this, we do have to backtrack to the book that was found in the boot of his car. This book was called Into the Wild. And it's a very famous book. And if you're aware of it, you know the story and you're probably already thinking, oh, it was about a person who disappeared under very similar circumstances. It was a person who struggled with finding themselves and fitting in and everything. And he leaves everything behind and goes to live in the wild. And I think he makes his way on up to Alaska. So that's a bit like, okay. Did Lee Cutler gain inspiration from this book? Potentially. The third theory is actually based on Judaism and the Torah, which is their, like the Jewish Bible. The Torah says something specifically about October the 20th, which was the day Lee went missing. But it says basically to go and leave everything behind, trust your religion, trust that God will take you where you need to be. Whatever it's something happening on October the 20th, but the fact that it was that specific, I don't know, it's, uh, it's definitely something to consider. But then again, a counter argument to this would be, he left his yarmulke behind, so why would he do that? That doesn't really align with that, but I definitely still think it's a very important one to note. The fourth theory is one that I only saw a little bit of speculation about, but I did just kind of want to 
discuss it and talk it out and just see what you guys have to say about this as well. And that's that it was a homicide. It's almost a little convenient that everything is so set up to kind of look like a suicide. There's a note, there's medications, but they still haven't found a body. So like I said in the suicide theory, you can't hide your own body. If you've committed suicide, you have no more control after that. So how could his body still not be found? Let's just say someone killed him, okay? Either accidentally or on purpose, and I'll get to that in a sec because there are kind of sub theories to this theory, but they could easily want to hide his body. And since Lee's car was there and they probably couldn't get into it or access it, they could kind of cover their bases by setting it up as a suicide. So when I say accidentally, I mean, maybe it could have been a hunter. There was a lot of hunting in this area, so it could have been something like that. Or when I say on purpose, I mean, tensions were running pretty high at home. He was not in a happy home environment. He didn't get on with his stepdad. Like I said, I don't know to what extent they didn't get on. I just don't know if this has been looked into by the authorities or anything. I don't know specifically where the stepdad was on the morning slash early afternoon on October the 20th. Could have been something like that. I'm not saying it definitely was. However, we do know that Lee bought the Advil PM and the Coracidin alone in Walmart. But furthermore, we don't know if there was someone waiting for him in the car when he was in Walmart. Maybe someone went and told him to buy those medications so that they could set it up as a suicide. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. But if there was someone waiting in the car, they probably would have left DNA evidence and I don't know if the car was tested for DNA evidence of anybody else. So I'm obviously very back and forth on this theory, but I just don't think it would be wise to totally disregard it. So the fifth and final theory of this case is that he left to join the IDF. Now the IDF is the Israeli Defense Forces. And this is something that Lee really wanted to do. Are you actually serious? I need sunglasses. Can I just tell the rest of it in sunglasses? <laughs> I genuinely want to film the rest of this video. I'm nearly done. I can't see anything unless I'm wearing these. But I just look ridiculous. I can't talk about true crime wearing these, my God. He even told his mom that he would do it whether she approved or not. Oh my God. What? parent wants their child to go into the Israeli Defense Forces. That's very clearly gonna be dangerous. Um, but because his religion was so important to him, he was like, I really wanna do it. <laughs> the one thing, like the main thing that comes to mind is, well, he needed a passport. He couldn't get from Illinois to Israel without a passport, but his passport wasn't at home. So maybe he did take it and go. Like passports are generally something that you keep in one spot because they're such an important document and if you lose it, like it's a whole hassle. So maybe he did, I don't know. But then what about money? Like he left a chunk of money in his wallet that they found. And I presume if there was activity in his bank account that we would know about it. And also then, why did he have to drive out so far and set up camp in this random place in the middle of nowhere? I don't know, it's a lot of questions. <laughs> if you're traveling somewhere, surely there's a record with an airline somewhere. And if that was the case, I mean, they also would have had CCTV of him in an airport. But again, I'm not sure how thoroughly this was looked into anyway. And that brings me to the end of this case. I think the main thing with this one is just like, his family still don't know what happened. And yes, there are strong theories and yes, you can believe whatever you want, but that doesn't mean that we should stop looking or stop getting his story out there. The thing is, he went missing almost 13 years ago and his family still don't know what happened to him. Maybe he did take his own life. Maybe he did go into the wilderness and is just surviving in forest area. Or maybe he went on a religious pilgrimage and that took him who knows where. Or maybe he was killed or maybe he's in Israel. I like, and if he went to Israel, maybe he has been killed since. I, I just don't know and the family don't know. I think that's 
the main thing. But yeah, please let me know what you think happened to Lee Cutler. Which of these theories do you think is the strongest? Which do you think is absolutely no way? But yeah, leave a like and a comment. Turn on the notifications. I upload every Friday at 3 p.m. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye.